So um, we're just at eight o'clock um, and I see people signing in and uh, jumping on the chat here. If you're just joining us, uh, welcome to our Project Dragonfly Miami University webinar. Um, we're so happy to be connecting virtually with you all. Um, I think we've all gotten more and more used to Zoom and Google Meets and, and so forth. And one of the benefits is that we can connect with you um, even if you're living very distant from Oxford, Ohio. Um, so it's really great seeing folks sign in and letting us know where you're from. Um, so I see Brazil represented as well as a number of other spots. So keep them coming, say hello. Um, we really love to see that. Originally, we were gonna have this be a uh, Google, a, a uh, Zoom meeting where we would be able to have you all sharing some of your video and maybe going on your audio, but we had such a nice response um, that we decided, decided to go with this format just so we didn't have feedback issues and such with audio. Um, so, uh, so welcome again. It's great seeing you all. And I am Kevin Madison. I work as the Associate Director for Master's Programs with Project Dragonfly. Um, I live in Yellow Springs, Ohio, but I'm from New York City. I've also lived in Chicago. Um, my background is actually with pollinators and uh, urban ecology and so nature and cities. And um, I found myself out here in the Midwest um, working with Project Dragonfly. It's been great. I've been here eight years. Um, so what I'll do is um, I want to pass it over to our other panelists um, who are going to share maybe just a quick intro with their unique role and connection with Dragonfly. So Tanoya, I actually see you next on my screen. So why don't you jump on? Hello, everyone. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. I'm really excited to be here. My name is Tanoya Thompson. Um, I am originally from the Bahamas, but I reside here in Houston, Texas. Um, I am really excited to be on the call today with all of you. I work at the North American Association for Environmental Education based in DC, but I work remotely from Houston and I'm the environmental education specialist. So, so glad to see you all on and I will pass it on to Connie. Thank you, Tanoya. Good evening, everybody. My name is Connie Malone and I'm Project Dragonfly's Graduate Student Services Manager. I've been part of this program for uh, 13 years next month, uh, which has been very exciting. I've had the real privilege of working with um, well over 3,000 master students in some capacity uh, since we launched the GFP in 2009. Uh, have seen our program grow from no master's programs, uh, just earth expeditions going to seven countries with 10 classes to uh, today going to 15 different locations um, and having both the advanced inquiry program and the global field program in addition. So it's a pleasure to be with you all tonight and I will pass the baton to Ken. Hi, I'm Ken Willman. Um, I live just north of Cincinnati and have been in the Cincinnati Dayton area most of my, my life, though had spent some time in school in North Carolina. Um, I worked for 31 years uh, in research and development at Procter and Gamble, and upon retirement, sort of retired into the um, advanced inquiry program and have been there, I think, nine years since then. I started as a two in 2012 as a student and did my um, work on really engaging my own community of Fairfield, Ohio, in trying to get them to uh, create and improve uh, conservation, local conservation programs. And once I got my degree, sort of moved into a facilitator role and an instructor role uh, within Project Dragonfly. So as I said, been involved with it uh, since I, I retired. Great, so uh, that's the group of us that are gonna be sharing with you all tonight. Um, but again, to make this as interactive and as engaging as possible, we definitely want you all to use the chat, the 
um, Q&A functionality. If you do use the chat, there is a little drop down, and I think it's by default, it says to all panelists. You can send, certainly send us a message directly if you just wanted to come to us, but in most cases, you'll probably want to choose all panelists and attendees, and that'll just go to everyone. Everyone can see your question, and we can help answer it that way. Um, so thanks for being interested in this graduate program. I think this year is, as we all know, has been a really tough one, really crazy in many ways. Um, so I think it's, it's exciting that you're thinking about a positive change and trying something that will definitely get you out of your comfort zone. Um, I also know it's a hard time to be thinking about new commitments potentially um, and things like with the Global Field Program, which involves travel, with the Advanced Inquiry Program, which involves going to zoos or botanical gardens across the country. There's a lot of questions like, how is this going to work? How are these, is this going to be functional in this day and age? Um, so we're going to start off talking about that, about COVID, how this can work. But I think we're also going to talk about how this program in general, even beyond COVID, what it can do for you, what you can take away from it. Um, we have, uh, towards the end, we have some tips on applications. So um, we hope that'll be useful as you're starting to think about where to get your recommendation letters and um, how to fill out the essays and things like that. Um, and all of us are available for you all if you have questions even after this. Um, if there's something one of us says, um, we have our emails, we'll put them up on a slide or we can even share them in the chat. Um, and then you all can just reach out to us via email if you have any additional questions um, after this. Okay, um, so we'll start off with a little bit about Project Dragonfly Master's Degrees. We have uh, two programs and two degrees, so it's a little bit confusing sometimes, but they're all through Miami University um, here in Ohio. Um, what these programs will prepare me to do. We'll talk about Earth Expeditions because a lot of people, even if you're interested in the zoo-based or botanical garden-based advanced inquiry program, a lot of people are interested in Earth Expeditions. Like I said, we'll have some tips and then additional questions um, that we come across. So, but starting off, just like I said, sort of the elephant in the room is COVID. Um, so right now is a really hard time to be making decisions for the summer. Um, summer is our start time for new students. So at this point, as you all know, it's not clear exactly when we will have a vaccine, how effective that vaccine will be, how the rollout will look. There may be countries that lag behind other countries in terms of their ability to um, get a vaccine out to the public. So there's still just a lot of unknowns. Um, what I will say is that we will be following everything that Miami University is doing and recommending, plus our global initiatives offices, plus working with our in-country partners. And that is really the great thing about um, Earth Expeditions and the Global Field Program. Every country we uh, travel to, we have grassroots organizations we work with extensively who know the situation there and can tell us, here's what's happening, here's what our government is recommending, um, anything that we need to do to adapt, we will do. Um, and so in terms of just timeline for the Earth Expeditions, the earliest one starts in May 20th. And just stepping back and walking back from that, um, if you apply to the Global Field Program, the application date is due January 28th. We usually let people know early to mid-March. And then I would say we would also be making any decisions in March as to if there are countries that we need to make special accommodations for in terms of travel or that we cannot travel to, we would make those decisions at that time. And we would have options for everyone. So this past summer, we had to unfortunately cancel all of our Earth expeditions because of COVID. Um, it was the safe thing to do, but also a heartbreaking thing to do. Um, because there's such great projects happening in these places. Um, and a lot of these locations really benefit from uh, tourism and travel and that kind of engagement. But in any case, we were able to shift to an online only course that was called Conservation Connected. 
Um, and we had 250 students uh, engaged in that and making real change, even remotely and virtually um, through that. So we have options, we can make things happen. For the zoos, um, maybe Ken, I'll put you a little bit on the spot because um, you work with the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden. Each zoo we work with um, and has its own particular guidelines that it's dealing with right now. So where is Cincinnati Zoo at right now, Ken, and how are you guys dealing with this? Well, where the Cincinnati Zoo is right now um, is we do have guests coming in. I think they're limited to about 2,000 guests uh, per day. And so folks register. As far as classes go, there are, I think there's plannings and thoughts, but they haven't had an okay yet or knowledge yet on how to start classes. So we have been going online with the zoo classes and, and sharing, exposing people to the different activities, the different parks, the different regions and things like that in Cincinnati until the zoo comes along and says, okay, we can have, you know, bring in 15 people and maybe have accommodations for them outside or, or some, some sort of safe accommodation. So it's just kind of a little bit of a wait and see and from a planning standpoint, but the zoo is open. Um, folks can come in uh, right now, though, the fall classes are all being handled, you know, virtually. Right. And, and that'll continue uh, into the spring. And one thing we, we do feel very passionately about is that if people are in a situation, we know not only are the, the, the spatial context of this pandemic is, is variable, right? There's different cities and states have different trend lines and so forth in different countries as well. Um, but uh, people's individual circumstances really vary too. So those of you that may be, um, you know, you have, you're a caretaker as well, and you have someone who has a compromised immune system or something like that. So you may feel less comfortable than others at doing some of the face-to-face -face at the zoos. So one of the things we're really working on is uh, for this spring, certainly we will have options that if there is face-to-face -face that becomes available, if it seems like that is doable, we will also have a virtual option if someone just does not feel comfortable that way. Now, moving forward into the summer and beyond, it's unclear where, where things are gonna be in, in terms of all that, but uh, I think we really wanna make sure everyone feels safe with these courses. Um, one other thing I should just say is that you can always defer, so you can apply to the program and then you can, if you are accepted into the program and for whatever reason, COVID or something else, maybe you realize in March or April that you're not gonna be able to do it, you can defer and start in a subsequent semester. So that is a nice option, especially in uncertain times, such as it is now. Um, there was a question that I saw in the chat about, uh, can you apply if you're an international student? And yes, you can. Um, so for in the case with the, the zoo-based programs, um, when we had travel that was required to the zoo face-to-face, -face, that could trigger the need for an international student visa. Um, but the global field program, which involves these shorter stints um, in countries internationally, usually do not trigger that requirement for a visa. Um, Connie might mo know more about that, but certainly email us if you're interested and you're an international applicant because there is a whole support network uh, for that within Miami, Miami University. Okay. Um, so yeah, I already mentioned it's, it's, it's a university. <laughs> it's, uh, there's some brick and mortar there, even though uh, a lot of our students and graduates and maybe Tanoya and Ken were like, well, not Ken, because he's one year for undergraduate, but a lot of our, our students in the program uh, first step foot on the campus at, at graduation because uh, this model is really distributed. Um, so, but it is a beautiful campus. Um, we are located in the Department of Biology. And one thing that makes it unique, we get a lot of questions, people wondering, do I have to have a science background? And the answer is no. Um, we actually uh, encourage and really feel that a diversity of undergraduate backgrounds and life experiences in general is really important. 
And that when we just put all the science people together and all the education people together over here, that doesn't really help move social um, and ecological change. So um, whatever your background, we've had theater people, we have had art people, business people. Um, Connie was mentioning historical preservation <laughs> as her background. Um, so yeah. So um, I mentioned that it may be a little confusing. We, we have two degrees and a Master of Arts, the MA, and then an MAT, which is the Master of Arts in Teaching. And that one is really for already licensed teachers. Um, so that is a way for you to extend your, your education. In some states, depending on where you live, it may come with a pay raise. It may also just be something that your um, school and your principal supports. Um, so MAT and then the MA, um, so two different degree options. And just so you know, if you're not sure which one, we can help you with that. Um, also, you can uh, change those once you enter into the program. Um, both programs, so we have the GFP, which is the Global Field Program, um, and then the Advanced Inquiry Program, or the AIP. And both are 35 credit hours, um, and they take about 2.5 years. That's the minimum, but you can go up to five years, and you can even go beyond if you need to. Um, some people want to just crash through really quickly. Um, some people are at a point in their life where they're like, whoa, 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 slow down. I've got enough going on in my life, and they just want to take it at a slower pace. So we try to make that uh, either uh, path available to you. Um, if you're in the Global Field Program, you have 21 credits that are three Earth expeditions over three summers. Um, those are about 10 days in the field plus online uh, components, and then 14 credits that are purely online. Um, and then if you're in the Advanced Inquiry Program, instead of those three Earth expeditions, you will be taking these engaging courses that are online with experiential learning at a a zoo across the country or a botanical garden that we partner with. Um, and Ken is a perfect example. He went through the AIP, but he also did an Earth Expeditions to Belize. So you can travel in that program as well if you want to. Here are our, our uh, Advanced Inquiry Program locations. So if you don't know the zoo and botanical garden world, informal science education world, you know, these are some of the major, major players in conservation across the country in the United States. Um, the Wildlife Conservation Society, WCS, is a huge conservation organization. All of these are doing amazing work. Cincinnati Zoo, of course, um, which was where we started uh, this whole program here in Ohio. Um, so just a wonderful group of organizations that we partner with. So if you're in any of these city locations or can drive to them or get to them on a reasonable basis, um, you can be a part of that program. And here are our 16 Earth Expeditions locations uh, across the globe, where we have courses like Guyana, Local Wisdom and Conservation, India, Species, Deities, and Communities. So hopefully these names are inspiring for, for you. And for me, seeing this map is a little bit sad because we didn't get to travel last year, like I said, but we are definitely um, excited for this coming summer. And I am feeling the travel bug. I'm sure a lot of people are feeling ready to get out into the world. Um, so the way this works is that in your first summer in the program, um, we have uh, our, our uh, boot camp courses, we call them. So we have Baja Field Methods, Belize course uh, on environmental stewardship, and then Brazil on saving gold mine tamarins. Those are the three options for first year students. And then after that, you can choose any of these other locations. Okay, um, that map is on our website, of course, or um, all those are listed on our website. But I know I've been seeing the flash of the chat, so I think we have some questions, and I also figured I'd turn it over to Tanoya and Ken to share some of their thoughts. Do you want to try to work through the questions first? Because it seems like there's been about six or seven questions come along, and so maybe sure. 
we ought to, before we change a little gears, scroll back up and make sure we've addressed or Connie has addressed. Yeah, Kevin, I've answered many of them. Um, several of the attendees would like to know a little bit more about what distinguishes a Master of Arts from a Master of Science in, in biology, specifically in the field, mm -hmm. and whether or not um, you feel that has bearing on the employability or prospects after graduation. That's that's a great question. Yeah, so the, um, the MS, a Master of Science, tends to be more um, it's a thesis that you're going to write, uh, original research thesis. Um, just, just so we're clear, we do not offer an MS, okay? So that is going to usually be a residential um, program where you're going to be at a university, more of a standard setup where you work with a professor and there's a lab and you have a research project and you write up your thesis um, over some time. So that tends to be more specialized. Um, some might say hard science. Um, in terms of employability, I mean, it might head you a little bit more towards labs or research type positions. Whereas an MA, a Master of Arts, is gonna be more like a liberal arts education. It's gonna be a little bit more varied in terms of the scope of things you're involved with. So you might be involved with research, but also communication of research and engagement with the community and um, how to create media and just a variety of different skill sets. Um, so I think it's, it's broader, the MA. Um, I think it gives you a lot of great skills, but they might seem a little bit more like soft skills. Um, I actually think those are amazing though. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my initial thoughts on it. I don't know Kevin, if anyone else can, can I share. just give some perspective just as a hiring manager for 30 years, mm. since it's a hiring related question, to me, yeah, there's, as you said, there's oftentimes different expectations. An MS one often thinks is a thesis master's, though I know some MAs who have been thesis masters and, and the university has just decided to put it in that location. As a hiring manager though, once you get somebody in the door with a master's, you wanting to know what they did and who they contacted and the network and things like you, like you said, for an MS, if you're wanting to hire somebody for a straight technical lab position, you're looking at whether it's MA or MS, did this person do a lab type position or lab work or lab experience? If you're wanting to talk to somebody who is in conservation psychology, as an example, you know, you're wanting to know what they did and, and, and uh, what their accomplishments were. And also I think the opportunity here for a network. Networking is so important nowadays. And so they both give you the opportunity, I think, to talk with other folks, professors, things like that, and build a network. Uh, and, and those are the two things as a hiring manager I looked for. Absolutely. I'll actually jump in on that as well as being a recent graduate. Um, and I would say, I guess you could say mid-level career at this point. Um, I see an MS as very like, it's research-based, right? It's, it's very geared toward academia. So if you're interested in, as Kevin and Ken have both stated, you know, more of the, the hard science which I don't really even like to use that term because like science is science, right? But the hard science, you wanna be crunching numbers and, and pursuing research, then, then that's probably the direction you might wanna take if you're looking at your own personal goals. But if you are looking at it from more of a practitioner base an MA, especially a program like this is super valuable because not only do you get that experience within research and communication and project management and building and curriculum development and all those things, you, you still are like, you know, nesting it on top of science, you know, and it's, it's a mix of science. And I think especially moving forward in the environmental education field, conservation field, wildlife, whichever way, name you want to name it, having a well-rounded portfolio goes very, very far. So that's just my like two cents in all of it. 
Yeah, I agree. And, and I think both of you made such good points. Um, so yeah, so, so think about the nice thing about the MA um, or the MAT really with, with Project Dragonfly is that all of it's inquiry based. So it's a lot of you thinking about what do I want my projects? What do I want to come out with? What kind of skills? So it's not going to be laid out for you like it would be in some programs. You're going to have to think about, oh, hey, I want to switch careers. So maybe I need to develop this skill in GIS or I need to develop this other um, or I need to get a teaching portfolio going um, because I want to get into that field. So there, there will be some thinking about what do you want um, from it. And uh, yeah, so keep, keep the questions coming. Um, but I want to just step back a little bit, um, Tanoya. I know we had started, um, so because there's a question about how do you work while doing this program? And you were talking about the countries you travel to with the GFP, but maybe you can share your perspectives on like working and being in this program and how you traveled and so forth. Absolutely. Um, so there was a great question from, I believe, Michael, um, if, if you can do this while working. And it definitely is a lot of sacrifice and a lot of hard work, but it's doable. Um, I had a full-time job, two part-time jobs, and a two-year-old when I started. Uh, so there was a lot going on. And what I love best about the program is um, it's super adaptable. The instructors are, are very um, engaging and supportive. And so everybody recognizes that life happens. You know, there's a lot that can happen in your 2.5 years of, of working on this. Um, and so that I just kind of wanted to put that out there that it, it's definitely adaptable for your life. Um, that being said, you, you do have to get that organization system that works for you to balance all of it. So I will say as a GFP, a GFP student, um, I, you know, was really excited when I started the program. The, the draw for me was not only, um, you know, the inquiry-based learning that I had the opportunity to dive into and the project work that I had the, the time to dive into, um, but I was excited about the, obviously the travel aspect because that's, that's really exciting. And being a mom of a two-year-old, you know, there's not a lot of field opportunities that, you know, you can take for short stints and kind of get that, that feel of being out in the field. Um, and I went to Baja, Mexico. Um, I went to Brazil and I went to Mongolia. And if you would have asked me early on in the program, if those would have been my three places, I would have, those were not the places that I would have picked if I looked at it on paper initially. Um, but I, what I really like about the program is all the courses and the way that things sort of um, are laid out, it really puts you on this self journey of, of inquiry within like yourself. And as you develop your master plan and as you develop your systems and your goals moving forward, um, the right places and, and the right projects in your courses just kind of sort of come to light. And, you know, sometimes, you know, there would be times that you would struggle of like, okay, where am I going and what is this path? But there, the way that everything is structured is just super organic in terms of developing it. And it is what you make it, right? It, I mean, just like any experience in life, it's, it's what you make it. And so, you know, depending on what you're going into the program for and the goals ahead, it is a really great way to build a system to help you reach those goals. So I will, I can talk forever about the program, but I'll go ahead and turn it over to Ken to give his perspective. And, and Ken, as you give your perspective too, I wanted to point out a question a little further up in the chat from Jessica Fowler, who asks, what positions at a zoo like Cincinnati or Jacksonville does the AIP prepare you for? Um, for example, after completing the AIP, what positions would people be most likely to be hired into at a zoo? Um, let me try to answer that question first before I go on and, and move on. I mean, I think one of the things that make sure as you're joining the program, there's certainly 
networking at the zoo and meeting people at the zoo and meeting people in different departments like at Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden, you know, you'll interact with people who do um, horticulture, people who work with the animals, people who do research in uh, endangered species and things and people who do work in marketing, in uh, communications. So you have an opportunity to interact with those individuals and network with those individuals and meet them and get advice and guidance from them. Uh, it's not necessarily a program that one thinks immediately as funneling to zoo positions, you know, so where there's, like I say, networking opportunities and communications and horticulture and endangered species. Um, it's one of those things that, that there's opportunities to meet, but at the same time, you know, if your goal is to get a, ultimately a zoo position, you probably, you know, want to consider it, maybe even talk with the, um, the, the graduate advisor for that zoo, what sort of success or what sort of positions they've had at that, that zoo because I think I don't you know I want to make sure people understand there's an opportunity to network an opportunity to meet and that networking may turn into positions but it's not necessarily seen as a funnel towards zoo positions I don't know Kevin if you've got other thoughts on that no that's perfect I mean yeah it's it's uh, I remember having a dream of working at a zoo ever since you know I grew up in New York City and went to the Bronx Zoo and I was like oh someday I want to work there and then I, I finally was able to get a position, but it wasn't how I thought it was going to be. It was uh, in the education department, um, initially an internship at $10 an hour, uh, 20 hours a week. And I was trying to live in New York City. So, <laughs> um, but, you know, this program, we get some people who have that dream of working with animals and they want, they wonder if this can get them directly in the door. And I think what you were saying, Ken, it's like, Sometimes it happens, it may not happen in the way you think, and it's not a direct funnel into, especially animal, being an animal keeper, um, which by the way, is very hard work. <laughs> um, um, great and rewarding work, but very hard work. Um, so, but I think through all of this, and it's not just that you'll connect with the people at the zoo you're, where you're uh, uh, doing that experiential um, um, hours that we're gonna talk about, um, but you're also connecting with people virtually who are across the country and across the world sometimes. So you might be, sometimes we'll get, it's really cool. We'll have like a, someone who works as a rhino keeper in New York at the Bronx Zoo and they start connecting with a rhino keeper at San Diego Zoo Global through the um, online platform. Um, or we get people that are all trying to change their careers in, in different directions. So there's a lot of talking um, happening to that. So yeah. as far as a specific example at Cincinnati Zoo, um, the two volunteer coordinators at the zoo were both AIP graduates and got their positions after their graduation from the AIP program. So it can happen, it, but as Kevin says, sometimes it happens in different areas or different ways, as I said, through the education department or volunteer coordinator departments or things like that. Um, as far as my own personal experience, uh, I went with the advanced inquiry program kind of gave me a base here in Cincinnati. As I'd said earlier, I had uh, retired after 31 years of research and development and was trying to find out what was next or figure out what was next. And to me, the advanced inquiry program was attractive because um, it did let me learn conservation, kind of a new area or new area I was interested in exploring. It also let me understand and explore what was being done locally in my community, specifically of Fairfield, Ohio, in conservation. And I did uh, research on volunteering, research on recycling, research on uh, butterfly gardens and establishing those within the community. And also let me kind of network once again, learn more about from the community leaders what they were doing. And that was an interest of mine. When I finished up uh, in the program, I had about probably 40 business cards from different directors, different uh, academicians and things like that, that I had met. Because it's really cool if you're working on a project and you say, 
you know, I'd call up the, the director of parks and recreation and say, I'm a Ma Miami University graduate student. They'd set up a meeting with me and they'd sit down and we'd talk and I'd understand what they were trying to do and uh, try to get some programs working with them and had success in that. So for me, it was kind of staying local, but also still the opportunity uh, to take an earth exploration or expedition to uh, Belize and learn what they were doing about community engagement and community-based conservation and take some of that thought and that inspiration kind of back to Fairfield. So that's why I entered the Advanced Inquiry Program and, and kind of the, what I was looking for uh, at the time. And, and since then, I've, I've given many presentations from my graduate work. Uh, I'm an instructor now in the program. So it's kind of led me to where I am right now. Thanks, Ken. Kevin, uh, can I jump in yeah. really quickly? Yeah. Sorry, yeah, sure um, I, I've also seen in the chat, it seems like we have a lot of keepers or zoo animal people on the line. And I actually come from that background. I've been working in zoos and aquariums since I was 12 years old, volunteering, interning, and then working for 12 years um, at a small facility here in Galveston, Texas. Um, and it was when I started the program, I was still in that career field. And through, you know, some of my community engagement explor exploration, like Ken alluded to um, within this program, I decided I, I wanted to make a little bit of a career shift. And I, I moved into another um, small nonprofit working on um, advocacy and outreach. So it's definitely been, I mean, as coming from a keeper, you know, it's not... I think that it's 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 a degree program. Both programs are well suited to help you meet those goals, um, and it just depends on how how you want to you know adapt within the program and how you grow in the program, um, which is really great. And um, after I graduated, I actually started. I came on board like Ken did, and I started teaching as a community learning leader. So I co instruct um, the Baja course currently. So it's, um, it's, it's really what you make it, no matter you know, what, what it is that you pursue or what angle you pursue it from, looking at what you want to achieve ahead, it, it's, really on, it's really on you on how you want to, to apply the program to your life. Cool, all right, and um... Yeah, let's, let's, and I see some other great questions coming in and you all are doing so great on blowing up the chat. Thank you for engaging with us. And let's, what we'll try and do, if you didn't get your question answered, please don't uh, hesitate to post it again. Um, and we'll also um, make note of them and, and try and get to them. Some of them are gonna be covered, I think, in these next few slides. Um, so, maybe. Here. Okay, and thank you, Connie and Tanoya also are really responding to a lot of those. Thank you and Ken. Um, so this is just our, our mission. Um, so really what we are about is community. And so um, trying to get an alliance of people, I would say Dragonfly folks uh, that are in this program, you know, on the whole tend to be <laughs> incredibly positive, idealistic, optimistic, excited individuals who, you know, want to make positive change. So we're trying to build a community of people like that um, who aren't afraid to go out and, you know, talk to new people or try and make things happen. We have a lot of introverts in this program and it is very outside their comfort zone initially, but with the support, I think you find a way to um, engage with your, your community, both in Dragonfly and in your, wherever you live. Um, and this is just a picture from our Amazon course um, that I instructed a few years back. Uh, this one's great for all the bird, bird nerds out there, of which I, I am one. Um, there's thousands of species of bird in um, the Peruvian Amazon, so it's amazing for that, but also for seeing some really cool animals like giant otters and um, sloths, three-toed sloths, and, and all sorts of really cool things. Um, so just to be in a magical place and to experience that with other people. And um, so get to know, getting to know each other through that ex shared experience 
and also learning about conservation in the Amazon and what's being done. Um, so yeah, these are kind of the sort of themes and focus areas of many of our courses. So biodiversity threats and conservation. So what can we do about invasive species? What can we do about habitat destruction or fragmentation? What about positive things like corridors, wildlife corridors and such? Do they work? Where do they work? What situation? So really delving into those sorts of topics. Um, we have an evolution course, of course, uh, <laughs> being a biology program. Um, so really getting into the mechanism of how it works. Um, but really our bread and butter uh, in this program is the community engagement methods, um, helping you figure out how you can make engaging surveys, interactives, media, those sorts of things. Um, there is a requirement for you all to um, publish and, and submit something for publication throughout the time of the program. Um, so that's something that I think is a little intimidating at times for folks. Um, but again, there are, it's scaffolded and really built into the, uh, the curriculum. Um, this is our online platform. It's called Dragonfly Workshops. It's, it's actually, if any of you are familiar with things like Canvas and Blackboard and so forth. So it's kind of like that, but I, I feel like it's a little more personal and obviously connected to what we do. Um, so this is an example of how the platform would look. You'd have a course here, for example, the Baja course. Um, you would click on that and then you would see um, icons of all the other individuals that you met, in this case with Baja, that you met in person in, in country. And then you're going to also be engaging and talking throughout the semester about things you're doing once you get back from that trip. So all of your assignments, your syllabus, all of those things, all the interactions will be through this uh, platform. We've already talked a, a little bit about, but these are just some examples from the program that we have. So someone who started out as a teacher and, and went into from sort of formal education into informal education at the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago, someone who was um, a full-time mom uh, and then went into facility manager at a nature center. Um, a recent graduate, we have people that are unemployed, right? And especially now with COVID, um, many recent graduates and many people that have, are not recent, have actually been in the workforce for a while, have lost positions. So if that is the case, um, you know, you wouldn't be alone either if you were in between jobs or looking. Um, so just some examples there. We've had some folks create a new business um, or create a new nonprofit or foundation. Um, we have uh, one graduate who has the Beluga Whale Alliance now in Alaska, another individual who works with an elephant um, conservation group in Thailand. Um, so lots of, lots of opportunities there. Um, quite a few go on to pursue a PhD and we do get asked quite a bit if we would offer one. We haven't been able to do that yet, um, but uh, this can certainly prepare you for uh, uh, heading towards a PhD. Um, promotions, definitely. And there was that question about um, uh, if you're a teacher, do you recommend the MAT or the MA in biology? And in that case, I would say it really depends on what state you are located in and their guidelines. So some states, if you are a science teacher, actually, they may want to, see, they may prefer to see the MA in biology because they may just think that that is what they want for a biology teacher who's teaching AP courses or maybe college plus or whatever it is. But I would check with your, your state and your principal and ask them because it really varies across uh, the country. Okay. Um, and then some of those soft skills we've been talking about. So leadership efficacy, the belief that you can be a leader and that doesn't mean you're gonna get up with a bullhorn and uh, be in front of a crowd, but there's different ways to lead and there's different ways to make change. Um, so uh, finding your way of being a leader, I would say is a big part of this program. And then giving presentations at various associations. Uh, Tanoya, there is your organization you work with now. Uh, the NAAWE. Actually, I have a really funny story about yeah. how I even connected to NAAWE. 
it was through scrolling through resources in the Project Dragonfly workshop page. And I was just like, oh, I've never heard of this organization. And I became a member. And then I presented at two of the conferences and then through some other kind of like connected dragonfly sort of dots, I ended up meeting the executive director last summer. So it's, it's a really cool story, but it's just, it's wonderful that there's so many different resources and, and parts to the program that it's hard to put on paper, but it's, it's definitely there. So if anybody wants to hear that fun, crazy story, I'm <laughs> happy to, to have a chat with them afterwards. <laughs> you will probably get a few emails i think um yeah no it's cool how like just those small interactions are just noticing this link you know and it, next thing you know you're it's a different career direction um so yeah and then these are some of the publications that our students have had um for their papers they've written so it's in sort of a more science ecology focused thing like marine ecology um to the science teacher many of our teachers in the program will publish in um, the American biology teacher, a science teacher, and other teacher uh, practitioner focused journals. Um, so these are just some examples. Um, okay, um, so Earth Expeditions, um, again, if you're in the Global Field Program and, and you will go on three of these Earth Expeditions, um, if you're in the Advanced Inquiry Program, you have the option to go on one. Um, and once you're an alumni, you can go on as many as you want. Um, these are open, um, so to folks to, uh, take it various stages of their, their life. So, um, so you do your pre-field coursework, which is online. There's a synthesis paper. It's like a research paper and it's usually focused on the location where you're going. So, um, maybe I'll, I'll put Ken on the spot here. <laughs> Um, do you remember your synthesis paper for Belize? Yeah, it, it was literally about community-based conservation and the, the successes and not so successes about it, how um, programs not only in Belize but across the world uh, were run and, and yeah, so it really helped me prepare once again, not only for Belize, but I had an interest in how do I do that in Cincinnati area too. Right. And, and Belize is famous in many ways for having the community baboon sanctuary as one of the best examples of community-based conservation, one of the early examples of how that can be enacted. And so, um, yeah, it's, a, it's, I definitely got chills when I walked onto, onto the uh, sanctuary there after having, having read about it um, in various textbooks and such. And see your first howler monkey or hear your first <laughs> howler monkey. Yes. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll share some more about Belize in just a minute and maybe Tenoya will share about Baja um, being our, our local Baja expert now. Um, so yeah, 10 day field experience. Um, and, and some students will opt to, if, if you're going to travel all the way to Mongolia, like Tenoya did, um, and you're paying for that flight and all that, and going through um, jet lag and whatnot, you might want to stay longer. And some folks opt to do that, and that, and that is fine. Um, so, and those 10 days, all the, the food and, and lodging, of course, is included, and you're with the group, and all the transport and everything is, is covered and you're learning and getting some talks and lectures, but also doing a lot of seeing and experiencing. Um, afterwards, this one's really important. We get some people like, can't we just go to Belize and be done? And it's like, no, the whole point of that trip is to inspire action, right? So it's not just that we get to go on this fancy trip in this beautiful place and experience that for ourselves, but that we take that inspiration and then do something with it when we get home. Um, so like Ken was saying in, in Cincinnati or wherever you're from, that you take those ideals and those things you learned about community-based conservation, you find a way to make it. Um, okay. Um, so maybe I'll take a pause there. I feel like maybe we have a backlog of chat questions and Connie, do you want to 
respond to anything? You're on mute. I know, sorry, yes, okay, I know. So suddenly they come in a wave, which is awesome. So back a little further, um, 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 um. Marie had asked um, about a recommendation if someone is a certified teacher in ESE, and Marie, you may have to type some clarification. We may not know all these abbreviations. PRK-3, ESOL, um, and reading, would uh, the MAT be the best path as a global field program student? Yeah, that I I'm not sure, uh, Marie, about that one. But the, uh, I would say we'd have to know the state you live in and look at their guidelines. Um, so anyway, yeah, that might be. Feel free to email uh, myself or any of us. We can help direct you and find out more about that. Um, um. David wanted to know, I don't know if you can share this. Um, he says, out of curiosity, he wants to know if the um, person working in elephant conservation in Thailand, if you can share that person's name, he's curious if maybe uh, he was on the Thailand EE class with that person. Oh, maybe it's, yeah, Antoinette Vandewater is her name. I'm sure she wouldn't mind. Um, she's a collaborator now and actually is getting her PhD in South Africa. Um, but we've had so many wonderful people on that Thailand course. So um, that were many of which work with, with elephant conservation. So um, very cool. And uh, so, so John had asked, and, and I will field this one. Um, so he had asked before about the possibility of taking CGS, which is a non-degree seeking status at Miami University, taking those classes in advance of to joining the program. Um, he commented that the instructions that are currently shared on our web page are slightly different than what he's experiencing in that application. Um, so this is something we've become recently aware of. We did update our application instructions for the degree seeking area within there. Uh, we've just learned about the changes to the CGS application. So if that is a track you are pursuing, know that our instructions will be updated within the next day or two. So John, you don't have to wait. Um, and, and you can welcome, you're welcome to email at Kiffin said. You can uh, email any of us on the Dragonfly staff with specific questions and we'll help you with those if you don't want to wait till we get those fixed. Right. And this, we're talking a lot about the master's programs here, but we're fully aware that some people, they come in and they already have their master's, they already have an advanced degree, they don't need it for their career, and they just want to take some standalone courses, and that's totally fine, too. So there is a path um, for folks in that boat. Um, Kevin, Sarah Sherwin asked, when you travel, do you typically fly to the destination with the group or on your own? Uh, pretty much on your own, but we have these nice little yellow tags we uh, send to you all in the mail um, that you can put because you will run into people, especially in the connecting uh, hub airports, you'll uh, often be sitting there and if you see, you know, someone that looks like they're, they're about to go on an expedition as opposed to um, a, a more standard tourist location, a hotel or something, you know, and you see this yellow tag, it's a good chance they're in the program. And some of our students do um, actually plan to travel together. Um, I don't know, Tanoya, did you ever do that? Yeah, actually I did. Um, your first year, obviously, unless you join the program with somebody that you know, and you both have to happen to be on the same trip, it, it's not like you couldn't travel or meet up with somebody, especially because you get to spend a little bit more time online. You're put into groups for a group project before you go in the field. So it's not completely out of the window to travel with someone. But I actually met up with a friend that I became really close with in Baja. We met up at the Houston airport. She was coming from um, Milwaukee. And then we traveled from there to, the, to Brazil. And then Mongolia, one of my other Baja classmates, we met up and we flew together to Mongolia um, and back. And we did some like days in like 
Seoul, South Korea, and then we did like a day in China. So it's definitely fun to travel those long stints with at least somebody. But um, like Kevin said, you know, you, you most likely might, you know, meet somebody in the airport and that yellow tag is kind of like a, ah, dragonfly. And, you know, you can connect from there. But it's a pretty mostly instantaneous like community and then it just builds from there so thanks um so yeah so during let me just go back here um so in addition to the to the zoo based courses um and these field courses the earth expeditions you have these core courses which take place in the fall and the spring um, and all of these are asynchronous, um, largely asynchronous. More and more, actually, we are using some sort of informal Google Meets or Zoom calls for those that can make it. But we also are aware we have people in different time zones, people with different work schedules. It's very hard to mandate a specific time that everyone has to meet. So much of the coursework is asynchronous where you are posting your coursework and your ideas and your projects for feedback and doing that whenever you can. Um, again, we, we hope you all will actually dovetail and connect this to your work, your existing work. That, that'll make it a lot more doable, um, is if you can look at your current work situation and say, oh, you know what, I want to do this extension of what I'm already doing and wrap that into my graduate coursework. Um, so that is something to think about if you're in that position. Um, here are the names of the courses you would be taking um, in your first year and then your second year um, and your third year. These are just the core courses again. Um, but these again, you'll be connecting with people all over the country, all over the world um, and talking about different issues. Um, okay, so this is really, uh, Ken, this is gonna be your domain here. <laughs> Um, so these AIP, what we call, so this is the web plus, so they're online, but they're also plus experiential learning at these great um, science institutions um, that we listed previously. Um, so 21 credit hours, and there are some pictures here, but Ken, why don't you just share, because you instruct these, you went through it as a student, what, what are these like? Yeah, uh, the, the first class you would take is really what's called a foundations of inquiry. So it, it's a lot of the assignments, you know, are done on the web platform, but you would get together for five days, you know, sometime during the summer and just sort of learn what's the inquiry process. How do you do a science study? Go out and explore in the zoo different areas and things like that. It really kind of sets you up as a foundation uh, those five days learning about what's expected in the program. But then most of your assignments become once a week, you might have a web-based assignment where you're reading some articles about a topic of need or a topic of interest related to perhaps that, that, that class. And then you're responding back to those articles, doing some more research yourself. So that's how you start. And then after that, in the fall, spring, and summer, there will be a class, usually in the fall and summer, that meets on a Saturday, four times during the semester, really about once a month. And once again, most of your assignments are still done on a you know, web-based platform, um, but you get together to kind of go in in depth on a area of interest, maybe give presentations, uh, give talks at the zoo. We do one on issues at Cincinnati Conservation where we spend a day at Fernald Preserve, which was a former uranium reprocessing plant nearby that's been turned into a preserve or a farm that's been turned over to wetlands. So you get together for the, for those days on a Saturday and uh, explore that local area of interest, but still do a lot of your assignments online. Thanks, Ken. And just other examples, since, since I mentioned them from New York City and know the Bronx Zoo well, um, they have some great collaborations with like uh, 
I think it's called, it's called like the Gotham Coyote Project or something along those lines dealing with human wildlife conflict with coyotes in um, much of Upper Westchester, New Jersey area. Um, also things like uh, looking, we have students looking into Diamondback Terrapin Conservation on Staten Island. Um, we have folks that have worked, done internships with the Manahata Project, which is re-envisioning uh, what uh, Manhattan used to look like and how it's transformed uh, as one of the most altered uh, landscapes on the planet at this point, but re-envisioning what, what did, you know, uh, Times Square used to look like, what habitats were there and so forth. Um, so very cool things happening at all these locations. St. Louis, the Missouri Botanical Garden um, is really connected with urban ecology in general and pollinator projects and things like that. So um, but we could go on and on with examples. Yeah. Zoo kind of creates their own experience based on their skills, expertise, needs of the area and the like. All right. Um, so just to go into detail on one, just one of our 16 Earth Expeditions courses, Belize, um, this would be a, a first year course that is uh, available for those starting in the program. Um, so people always want to know, what, what does it look like? Where do we sleep? Um, so we'll start off with that slide here. So these sort of cabanas on this bottom picture, um, very cute, I think, um, in this sort of unique uh, pine savanna, tropical pine savanna landscape, which is the Tropical Education Center of, of Belize. Um, and this is the area where we would have some um, class gatherings up top um at the same location and also connect with the Belize uh, Zoo which is a really unique um, uh, zoo that is really engaged with the community has uh, a focus and pretty much all native animals to Belize and is really trying to help people feel pride in these animals um, here's some images of of the types of inquiries you might be doing, um, again, to sort of practice and get accustomed to the scientific process and also to reignite your own curiosity. Um, a lot of us adults, we've kind of at some point stop asking questions. <laughs> um, and it's really um, refreshing in, in my experience to start just being curious again about what you see around you. Um, can jump in at any point because I know you've got police stories, but <laughs> no, it's it's just an amazing area what they've done, and especially the Belize Zoo. Uh, the person who created it, I mean, there's a book, you know, written about it, and so you you meet Sharon Matolo, who's you know created it, and she, you know, person who's written a, it has a book written about her, just how she decided to create this zoo because most of the local people in, in Belize had not really seen the local animals. They'd heard about them perhaps, maybe even feared them, but they had no place to go to see these, these local animals. So she sort of gathered it and had all sorts of government issues she had to address and overcome. But it's now a, a, a wonderful place in Belize that is very popular and it gives a chance for, for Belizeans to see Belizean animals. Very cool. And I know some, we've had just a couple of people um, letting us know if they have to pop out or something. Um, but, you know, yeah, hopefully you can, you can stay on. We'll keep going for probably another, what are we at now? It's about, it's nine, actually 9.05. So we'll probably go for another 15, 20 minutes or so. Um, but feel free if you need to drop out, that's fine. We'll make the recording available. Um, the other great thing about Belize uh, is the snorkeling. And uh, this is the Great American Reef, um, the largest uh, coral reef in the Western Hemisphere. Um, it's from uh, seagrass beds, uh, which have some unique species to the actual coral reef. Um, it's just an absolutely amazing experience, something definitely to be on a bucket list if it's not already for you. And there's um, some cultural tie-ins with the uh, history of uh, Mayan um, uh, 
indigenous peoples in, in Belize and learning about the history there and the history of environmental um, uh, damage and you know use, I guess, through you know hundreds of years, right? That it's not just current. Um, so that's an interesting thing there. And this last one uh, picture at the bottom is, is journals. So we do journal in country, everyone takes a journal and reflects on their time and thinks about and takes notes and um, learns from that process. Okay, I know time is the issue for us, but Tanoya, I gotta hand it to you um, before we get into the slide and just, just maybe tell us a little bit about Baja. For, for those that just saw those cool Belize pictures and are like, it has to be Belize. I know, I'm like, oh, I wish I would have gotten a whale shark picture in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Baja is super near and dear to my heart, hence my, my plug for Baja um, in the chat. But I, it was obviously my first um, trip and uh, my, I, I feel like every course kind of feels this way because it's the four, there's something about the first course and being together. Um, but my classmates are like friends for life and it, it's just an amazing experience. Um, spending that amount of time in the desert, like completely like disconnected from everything back home. And it's like, I don't know if any of you remember like MTV's The Real World, like this is the story of 26 people or 20 people picked to explore country see what happens when things get real. We made up all sorts of like funny things along that, but it really is um, an amazing experience when you are disconnected from everything at home and you're focused in on these amazing ecosystems and learning so much from the people and the culture. Um, and it's just, it's, it's literally like a magical experience. Like the wildlife is like a, a bonus, but there's so much more to it than that. Um, and because of that connection that I felt, I stayed in touch with the executive director and um, the Galvan family and just continued to foster a relationship throughout, you know, the courses and, and, and things of that nature. And then um, when I started working with Miami as a co-instructor or a CLL, um, they put me in the Baja class, which I was really excited about to, to go back as an in instructor. And that kind of sealed the deal for me, um, being on both sides of the fence as a student, but then also in an instructor role was just, um, just incredible to see both sides. And, um, you know, because of my connection, I, you know, reached out and just kind of talked to the executive director of the Vermilion C Institute, Megan. And I was just like, is there any way that I can support you? Because this just means so much to this place is just amazing. And I want to stay a part of it. I want to stay connected more than 10 days in the field. Um, and so over the past year, I've been just kind of helping and, and, and guiding and using any expertise that I have or connections to just support this amazing work. And literally last night, after some talks for about six months, um, I was voted in as the board chair for the Vermilion Sea Institute. So it's like, I don't even know how much fold that is. It feels like a hundred fold, but it's just, it's just an amazing place. And it just makes you want to just always be a part of it. Everything from the children in Bahia to the fishermen to the amazing whale sharks and sea lions and blue-footed buoys that you get to see and exploring, you know, all of the different islands, um, but even the desert. And I'm a marine girl. I just, I love the Bahamas and I, I love my, you know, being underwater, but like I fell in love with the desert as well. So I could do like an hour pitch for Baja. Again, sounds like we need like an extra time for that, but I just wanted to kind of plug that in that it's just, it's an amazing place. And I mean, all of the spaces that I've been within Earth Expeditions have been amazing. And I think the beauty of this is you're going to be right where you need to be with the people that you need to be for that moment in your life, which is like pretty much magical anywhere. So um, I'll definitely always like support my favorites, but I think um, wherever you need to be, you'll, you'll find that place. Very cool. Um... And, and just, uh, there's a quick question there about, you know, is, is snorkeling required in these locations? I will say, 
Um, in general, all, all of the Earth expeditions will push you outside your comfort zone in some way, right? It may be traveling to a country you've never traveled, it may be snorkeling, um, but you are gonna be supported through all of that. Now with the snorkeling in Baja, I think there is possibly the best teacher. <laughs> the of, best. Uh, yes, the best the teacher best. of how to do this. Step breaks it down step by step. And I've seen people who didn't feel comfortable swimming or you know anything, putting their head in the water, um, come out in in a great place from that experience. So yes. um, keep an open mind, work with your instructors and You'll have, each one of those courses has an instructor, a Miami University instructor, plus a community learning leader like the role that Tanoya has been in, um, and also the in-country partners. So there's a, a sort of a suite of people that are there to support you all. Um, all right, so um, these are on the slide. Um, these are some of the things you can do in terms of making a difference when you get back home. Um, these are just some examples. I won't go through them as we're short on time, but just an idea of the types of projects some of our students have taken on. And um, actually, this is pretty good timing. This is a, a final quote, um, kind of related to what we were just talking about. I have learned so, uh, so many amazing things, not just about the places I've been in the global community, but about myself and my own capabilities. Um, so again, you know, no matter how old you are or what stage you're in, I think we all have things we can connect back to. Um, and that's what we try to do with this program. All right, um, we are gonna segue now into any additional questions. We've been kind of taking those as we go. Um, so, and I also wanna give Connie the time to really go through the application tips, okay? So, Connie, what do you think? Should we jump right into the application or? I, I think we've, got, we've done pretty well tackling um, the questions in there. We have one that just came in. Um, would we be able to take our family with us on expeditions? That would be uh, really difficult. And, and I have been tempted as, as an instructor in the program, but it is just very hard because you're pulled in different directions. So currently we don't, um, we don't support that. Um, but we have, have had people that have had their family come meet them um, at the end. And also in, if you're worried about that, um, the advanced inquiry program may be a nice connection. I think sometimes, and Ken, you know more about this, but the advanced inquiry program really can attract people that want the option of traveling, but maybe they don't wanna to commit to it for three summers Maybe they want to do it once or maybe not at all, and they still want to get in, involved in global conservation through the connections with the Zoo or Botanical Garden. Definitely. Yep. Okay. Um, so we'll keep uh, responding to chat as we go, but uh, Connie, let me okay. hand it over to you. All right. So my part is not as exciting as everything that everybody else has just talked about. So this is kind of a little nuts and bolts um, process steps here. Um, so we'll begin with some application tips. Um, so the first and foremost thing is if you, if you are considering applying to the Global Field Program, to the Advanced Inquiry Program, to Earth Expeditions, please start early. Um, get your essays together contact your references if you need them for the master's program. Uh, begin working on your essays, find out how to go about getting your unofficial transcripts, um, get those things together. And the earlier you can start, uh, the greater the likelihood is then that you will meet the application deadlines, which are January 28th for the Global Field Program and Earth Expeditions, and February 28th for the Advanced Inquiry Program. Um, when you submit, if you are applying to a master's program, you'll submit the names and email addresses of at least two people from whom you'd like letters of recommendation. Um, the new system, the graduate school has a new application system, which now, as soon as you enter it, will generate those auto requests. But nonetheless, you want to make sure that you do provide sufficient time for your references to get their information in for you. 
Um, speaking of references, uh, we get this question quite a bit. Um, who should we ask? People will ask that. Um, in general, we definitely do recommend that you get a professional as opposed to a personal reference. And by professional, it doesn't have to necessarily be your job, though it can be a boss, a supervisor, um, a colleague. Um, it can also be a former professor or a teacher, or perhaps you're in a volunteer capacity and you um, work with somebody there, somebody who's the director, executive director, or something within that group. So somebody that has that kind of objectivity as opposed to just Aunt Betty or your neighbor um, is generally preferred. Third of all, spend some time thinking about your essays. And when we speak to applicants, um, and, and this sometimes feels really hard, uh, writing that essay, because we know you want to write the best be all end all thing that will just convince us to bring you into the program. Um, I always like to tell applicants that th the most important thing here is to speak from your heart to speak in your own voice. Uh, there is not one ideal response to our essay questions. Uh, we are not looking exactly for specific things. Again, this uh, program welcomes people from every academic professional background. Um, so even though we do have a lot of people who come to us from the fields of education and the sciences, as Kevin mentioned, they also come to us from business and law and the arts and special education. Um, so even though you might want to tie in your essay, as we say, if you are early in your career or considering a career change, you might want to talk about what you hope the program will do for you with regard to your career goals. Um, you might want to highlight your hobbies and your passions as those relate to the natural world and making those connections to nature and then making those connections to the overarching goals of the program, which you can get from a good read through the website. Um, next slide, please, Kevin. So as you are preparing your materials, one of the things that you will, again, if you are, um, actually, if you're applying to any of them, Earth Expeditions, the AIP, or the GFP, you will need to upload a copy of your resume. Um, if you're coming from some backgrounds, you might have a curriculum vita. Um, that's okay too. You can upload that whole thing. Check it for typos, check it for misspellings. Give it to a friend, a family member, a coworker to review for you. Uh, one thing we've learned over time, no matter how good a writer or editor you are, um, we all miss things. Our eyes skim over material that we've become terribly accustomed to, to the point where we no longer see things. So pass those along to somebody you trust for a second look. Uh, if you're applying to the Advanced Inquiry Program, each of our master institution partners uh, throughout the fall and into the early winter will have open houses or info sessions. Um, those schedules are not on our website, but you can link to each master institution's website and those dates are shared there. Uh, we do try to share those dates through Project Dragonfly's Facebook page as well. So uh, if you haven't been there, we hope you'll visit it. Um, our team does a, a, an amazing job of sharing our students' stories there. It gives you a great look at the kind of work our students are doing. And it does share these open house dates. Um, we do have applicants who will be interested in joining us who see on the Graduate School's website uh, that there is a 2.75 on a 4.0 scale minimum GPA for regular admission. And we'll hear from people uh, with great regularity who are close to that but just under um, or who are significantly under but maybe have been working in the field for 10, 15, 20 years or who have advanced degrees. Um, if, if that situation applies to you, please know that um, a sub 275 GPA does not preclude your program admission. Uh, while the grad school just looks at your transcripts and your criminal record, 
uh, they look at that too. Um, our review committee looks at the entirety of your application package. So they're gonna, they're gonna look at those transcripts, but they're also going to look at your references, at your resume to see what else you've done in your life. Um, they're going to consider the entirety of it. And if they feel like you would be a good fit for the program, we have the option of submitting a petition for what's called conditional admission. And every year we do this and our students who are admitted conditionally uh, do an excellent job. Um, we've, we have had tremendous success with that. It is something we are very comfortable doing. Um, finally, double check for typos and misspellings. Again, that goes back uh, to what I referenced with your resume, do it with your essays too, please, before you submit. All right, so how to apply, um, we hope, except for the CGS instructions, which we have realized are not updated. Um, the process is, is very similar for Earth Expeditions, for the Global Field Program, for the Advanced Inquiry Program. Uh, the slide you see here shows a screenshot of the Earth Expeditions Apply page. You can see on there two different links, one in the left menu bar, one on the right hand side. You click either of those links and they take you to our Apply page, which <laughs> um, shows you the two steps for an Earth Expeditions application. Uh, the first one is to complete what we call the pre-application or I'm interested form. It's just a very basic form that gives us your, your contact information, tells you a little bit, tells us, excuse me, a little bit about what kinds of things you might be interested in. Um, that helps us customize a little bit some responses to you. It gives you the chance to ask some questions at that time. Uh, the second step is creating an account in my Project Dragonfly. And My Project Dragonfly kind of double dips. It is part of our application process. It also functions as a student information management tool. And within that space, you'll be asked to share your contact information, personal information, academic information. And for Earth Expeditions, you'll also share your essay questions here or your responses to your essay questions, you'll upload your resume or curriculum vita in this space as well. Um, the process is very similar for the Global Field Program. Again, here we are on uh, the Global Field Program homepage, similar to the EE page. You can see the two links to get to the apply page. And once you're on the apply page, again, very similar layout. Um, the first two steps are basically identical to what an Earth Expeditions applicant would do. But there is a third step here, which is that application to the Miami University Graduate School. Um, basic information is on this page. If you are um, applying to the master's degree program, in the frequently asked questions for both the GFP and the AIP, there is an FAQ on how to complete the graduate school application, which offers some specific detail. Uh, the one point we share on this slide is um, on the application, when you're answering the question, what program are you applying to and degree, in this space, you will not see AIP or GFP. This is the space where you'll indicate your target degree, which again is either going to be the Master of Arts in Biology or the Master of Arts in Teaching in the Biological Sciences. And AIP very much mirrors the GFP. Um, same thing, home page, two spots to click apply. And then when you get to that apply page, um, just like the GFP, you're going to see the three steps completing that pre-application I'm interested form, uh, creating and completing your account in My Project Dragonfly, and then submitting your application to the grad school. Uh, we do have, we didn't address it in the slides, but um, we do have a number of people every year who want to apply to both programs, and that is perfectly fine. If you're interested in being considered for both programs, um, you'd follow these steps, you'd do two 
My Project Dragonfly accounts, but you'd only do a single graduate school application because that would count for both programs. And I think one more, Kevin, please. All right, that was super quick in the interest of time through the application process. Um, I don't know, there have probably been questions listed. Any other questions about the application process? We've been, uh, I think, responding to many of them. Um, there's maybe a few more that'll pop in, but I just wanna take this moment to thank you. Thank again, everyone for attending. Um, actually, uh, I did have a final slide that I think because I just closed it off, but Tanoya and Ken, if you wouldn't mind, if you wanna pop your email in the uh, chat in case anyone wants to follow up and I'll do the same. Ani, if you wanna do that as well. Okay. Um, and so we all are, are available if you have additional questions. Um, uh, and yeah, thanks again for, for spending some time with us, but let's just see if there's any other um, questions that we want to answer or that we can answer. There's questions about the costs, um, and I know that's always on people's mind. I'll just say we, we have a web page. Um, Connie, do you want to pop that in there, the cost page? Absolutely. Um, so, and, and the Earth Expedition cost is listed the basic cost on the GFP page. If you want to see the country specific costs, which th there's a base price that's the same for all of them, but a small number of our classes carry additional course support charges with them, that's listed on each country page. But yeah, I'll get I'll get those these in here. Thank you for that. And and the cost is uh, reduced quite a bit. It's um, Miami has committed towards making this program um, accessible for people so that it's, it's pretty much a fraction of the regular cost you would pay, um, which I think for Miami University at, for out of state is close to 1500 per credit hour or so. Um, and for us, it's around 400 or $500 per credit hour. Or so uh, much more affordable. Um, you know, the whole program, we have some estimates on the cost page that Connie just shared in the chat. Um, but both programs, the AIP or the GFB can be done um, for probably under 15,000 or so for the for the two and a half years. Um, of course, that depends on airfare and some other things, but um, we are doing our best to make it affordable so people don't have more debt. Um, Question about the acceptance rate as well. That's that's really varied through time um, as well and by location. So depending on what AIP location, you know, the acceptance rate could be anywhere from 30%, 40% to up to more like 80%. Um, and I would say when it is higher, I think we feel very good about that as well because um, many of the applicants are, are just exceptional people who have found this program and are willing to try something different. Um, so yeah, so that's that's some on that. Um, Tanoya, Ken, were there anything you wanted to jump in and say at this point? Certainly feel free to contact me or us if we can you know, share personal stories, experiences, help, uh, uh, you know, with any suggestions that, that might help you through how to think through the program. Uh, we put our emails up there or you can certainly get them. Um, you know, I'd be glad to answer any questions offline. I see a couple other application questions in here. Um, Paula asks, are the transcripts needed just from the school? I just lost it. <laughs> just from the school we got our most recent degree from or every school we've attended. So on the on the graduate school application, you'll be asked to attend, or excuse me, to list every school that you have attended. Um, you will, every school you list, you'll need an unofficial transcript for. Um, we've had a small number of applicants who are just like, just 
avid learners. They have taken not, you know, lots of classes in lots of places. Um, you can always list that information on your resume um, and omit that piece of it from the graduate school application if it's preferable to you. Uh, you definitely want to list your undergraduate degree. Uh, we recommend also including any post bachelor's graduate work you have done um, when you do that. So you would need all those transcripts. Um, I saw one other on there. Okay, John asked about older transcripts and how to make sure that they get to the right department. Um, Miami's graduate admissions has just actually um, been moved into the department that houses undergraduate admissions. And, and that will probably help with that kind of question. Um, if somebody has submitted um, their transcripts and you hear from us or you hear from the graduate school that, that we don't have them, we're always able to track them down. Um, if, if you have a receipt or confirmation from your school or like the National Student Clearinghouse, share that with us and, and we will track it down. Um, so you all have our contacts, so you can keep asking questions, but I am going to get ready to wrap it up here. Um, Tanoya, did you have anything else you want to say? Just basically the same. If you need anything or if you have more questions, feel free to contact any of us. I'm, I'm happy to, to schedule a quick call or, you know, correspond through email, um, but we're all here. So if you have more questions, feel free to bring them in. Thank you so much, Tanoya and Ken, for being available to help us with this. And again, thanks for the attendees. Um, if we didn't get to your questions, drop us a line. But thanks so much for your interest in the program. And um, we will make this all available, the recording um, as well. And uh, take care. Thanks for all the thank yous coming in. It's nice to see them. Um, appreciate it. And have a good night, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Good night.